and sometimes frightening, of course, because after every explosion and they fired, there was dust and everything could be blown down with water. Lunch, you would see a sea on the side. You had your sandwiches from the canteen, and uh, you would sit here in the rocks and just eat your sandwich and then go again. Falling rocks was one of the main major risks in this thing. That's why the safety officer comes always past with long steel bars and bars those loose rocks down. It's just not 100% safe. Bisognava lavorare e cercare di far sempre di più dell'altra squadra. L'americano con noi si comportavano molto bene personalmente, ma la ditta chiamava progresso. Una squadra cercava di fare dell'altro e fra di noi italiani ce le facevamo perché l'altro non facesse quel che ho fatto io. Voglio dire, c'era delle discordie sul discorso. Il lavoro, per conto mio, è stato il lavoro più grande della mia vita, dove ho sofferto più di tutto in quelle gallerie là. My supervisor there in the tunnel, he told me one day that in America, before he came in Australia, he was a bus driver in New York. So, we had to work under a bus driver, see? He was a good friend with me. I was going fishing with him, you know. His wife was a good friend of my wife there. And when we had uh, some uh, party up in, uh, in Happy Jack, he was there and he was a gentleman. He said, no, there was no problem again that. But on the work, on the work he was uh, an animal. He had to, otherwise he was losing the job himself, see? The worst accident I had was the last accident, and I even decided I leave the tunnel. I was drilling my controls were about 15 feet back, and I just moved back to adjust something, and bang, the fireball came out. I had a lot of injuries, and I think I was the first one out, because the others were lying there with broken legs, and like the fellow next to me, only shoulder on shoulder we stand, he lost both his legs and, you know. You could have bones sticking out of boots and you have to get big scissors and cut the rubber to put the bones back a little bit and strap them up. So it could be quite gruesome. But they kept the push on, they had to get the footage, they had to keep on pushing. And after this big accident, the Americans said, OK, you guys, you know, it's been really bad out there, but let's go back inside. If somebody had been killed, you wouldn't have gone back inside. But because nobody was killed, he reckoned, you know, get them back in, keep the production going. And everybody could see the logic of this. And so they all went back in and, and carried on after that bloodbath, you know. Sunday evening, we were all at home and mum was getting her hair permed and one of the guys uh, came in and said, there's, uh, there's been a terrible accident at uh, Tumut Pond. Mum immediately got dressed and went charging out into the snow. We didn't see Mum for another two days and two nights. There was a very severely injured man uh, with the uh, bad head injuries there, but they also found there was a lady in advanced stages of labour who they had to get to hospital because of uh, potential complications. What was amazing was the uh, lady who was uh, in labour was the wife of the very seriously injured uh, man. And to get out of Tumor Pond, they needed to use a bulldozer to tow the ambulance, which took them the better part of a day to do that. But it took my mother nearly another half a day to get back to Cabramurra. As she was starting to, to thaw out, I heard a bit of a, bit of a screech at, at one stage when she was getting into the, into the bath. 
she was wearing some red stockings, so she'd been wearing these all through the snow, so they were saturated. The legs were, you know, the, all, all red. And then she'd taken off her hat to see her hair was still bright orange and standing, standing straight, standing straight up. So it was a really, really interesting, uh, interesting time. Very, very courageous. Some guy got run over by the locomotive, you know. He was dead okay, you know. So I had to bring him out, put him in the ambulance, and drove him not down to Gank Open, but up to Jiha Township with it. There was a Dr. Baxter there, and I went up there, and that's one of the biggest fright of my life. I was driving up there, lonely winter's night, snowing, me in the front of the ambulance, the corpse behind me. All of a sudden, you hear boom, 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 like the corpse is trying to wake up or say something to me. I thought, Unreal, man. Keep driving, you know, driving. Snow, wind, boom, boom. I couldn't stand it anymore. I stopped. I got out and I walked around the back, opened the doors, and he was still lying down the stretch, but one arm had fallen off onto the floor of the ambulance and it was going boom, 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 boom. So I just put it back and tied it with a bit of bandage and took him up and we fixed him up, like fixed him up for death. Up there was the doctor and... Uh, Gee, I don't you. I'll never forget that night. When I was on night shift, well, graveyard shift, it was quiet, you know, unless something bad happened, you had the telephone link up with the tunnel, something went wrong and somebody was coming out injured, we got in the ball. Otherwise, you didn't go to sleep, you stayed awake, I had a big tape recorder and guitar, brought them down and started writing songs. It was pretty good, you know. My wife could sing a little bit and... I met a tall Englishman called Peter Barry. He worked for the Snowy as a bulldozer driver. So we started singing around the uh, wet canteens, you know, where they served the beer of the miners and the Commodore and the old hotel and Ginderbine, stuff like that. A friend of mine, uh, Olaf, he was a Norwegian, and he used to operate the bulldozer right outside the first aid post. But unfortunately, a couple of years later, when he was working on the Ginderbine Dam, he went over with his bulldozer and it flipped and it killed him. So I wrote this song in honor of Olaf. Oh, Olaf. Oh, Olaf. Along by the snowy river where Utah made a dam. We remember Olaf Groden. A dozer, driver man. All the experiences I had had, a lot of them did involve death. And a lot of them, you know, were ordinary things of workers' lives, the way it struck me. So I wrote quite a lot of songs up there before, uh, before leaving the mountains. Longer grew the tunnels, short grew all I've spent. From rock to dust, was the savage must for the dozer driver man. Right we used to rush home from the afternoon shift, which they used to call swing shift, which finished at midnight. By the time you get to the camp, it's probably half an hour later, because they didn't have modern buses like they had in the last few years, just a truck with a tarpaulin on top. And that's how you came out, cold and freezing. Into the sh and then, of course, the canteen is open all the time for a meal when you come home. But we didn't have time. We just quick in the shower and off in the car, three, four of us, into Kuma. So we got to Kuma usually around quarter to two, two o'clock in the morning. And then our night started, uh, partying. <laughs> 